going to talk to you about uh, leadership, um, new styles of, uh, of leadership. Um, so uh, let me um, let me get started. I do love to make it a little bit interactive here and there. So uh, uh, if there are any uh, questions, uh, please uh, please uh, announce them. Um, I will try to uh, try to answer at least uh, at the end all the questions, and uh, I will try to ask you here and there some questions to uh, to like I said, uh, keep it a little bit uh, a little bit interactive. Um, let me start presenting my uh, my slides. Um, and there you go. Uh, where's my cursor? One second. Share screen. Uh, this one, please uh, share. Um, like I said, I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, leadership, uh, navigating uh, new styles of uh, of leadership. Where are you guys? Refresh here. Let me quickly configure all my um, all my technology. Then uh, I'm ready to go. Um, leadership. That's what we're going to talk to uh, talk about. Leadership in an agile context uh, might be different. Should be different. Uh, so let's get this started. I hope that uh, I can get you a little bit here and there out of your comfort zone because that's what I believe uh, change happens. Um, let's get started with this. I directly have a question. So um, uh, if you uh, are capable of answering, then uh, please do so. Unmute yourself and uh, um, 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 you can answer the question, hopefully. Uh, who has an idea what this is? It's a train. Thank you very much. It's a very Dutch train, to be honest, uh, to be exact. Um, a very Dutch train because we love uh, our orange color and um, uh, you see the Dutch flag being uh, swiped off the train. Probably in India, the train looks a little bit more like this. Maybe this. Uh, but all fun aside, um, there is something strange with train trains, I thought. Um, so we have all kinds of trains uh, in the world, but the funny thing is um, that when they uh, designed the train tracks, uh, the majority of the of the tracks have the same width. Um, does anybody dare to guess how wide a train track is in millimeters or or or, or uh, centimeters, if you may? One point five meters. Sorry. 1.5 meters. 1.5 meters. You're pretty damn close. It's, uh, there's the train again. It's 14 and, uh, 35, uh, 1435 millimeters. Um, so why, uh, why do you think, uh, why do I, did I think that was interesting? Um, because the majority of the tracks in the, in the world have that same width, but 1435 millimeters is not exactly a very logical width, I thought. So I thought, you know what, it must be that if you calculate this to foot or inches or any imperial system, it must make more sense. But you know what, it doesn't. Um, and I wrote, uh, I looked up uh, uh, in the Dutch Wikipedia what uh, what is happening uh, with uh, with these train tracks. And apparently 1435 meters is called normal track, um, normal train tracks. It's invented in uh, in Britain, and that's why you'll probably find the majority the, the majority of uh, of the train tracks around the world, also in India, being 1435 millimeters. So I thought, why? Why the hell do we have train tracks and all standardized around the world with a width that doesn't make sense? Why is it not 1400 or, or 1 1.5 meters? Things that would have made, made sense. Um, so I was uh, I was looking up what uh, what the reasoning behind that is, and I found out that uh, the trams, uh, the city trams, uh, this one being in Amsterdam. Um, also drive on the same uh, track width. So apparently they um, they based the train tracks on the tram um, and they standardized it from there. So now, whew, solve that. But then I thought, huh? why the hell is a tram track 1435 millimeters? That doesn't make any sense to me. 
So I was going to look that up. Why the hell did we make that? And apparently we, before we had uh, 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 steam trams and, and, and whatever trams, there were uh, horse trams. Um, and uh, they also had 1435 millimeter train tracks or, or tram tracks in this, uh, this case. So they based the, 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 the electrical and steam trams on the, on the same track. Oh, kind of solved that one I thought, but hey, why, why was the uh, horse tram track 1435 millimeters, I thought. So I was going to look that up. And apparently um, they had um, horse and carriage and the horse and carriage uh, probably had slightly different width. And because they didn't want to uh, uh, go with the wheels of the, of the uh, horse and carriage, uh, between the tracks of, uh, of the tram, they made the tram track uh, that width or well, it would make sense because uh, all the horse and carriages were like uh, 1.5 meter. They made it slightly smaller so you won't uh, break off your wheels. Um, well, nice. Solve that one. But no, why the hell were already at that day and age all the horse and carriages standardized with the same width, I thought. And I looked up a little bit further and apparently in Roman ages, when we, uh, they were uh, conquering uh, Europe, uh, they were uh, driving their horse and carriages uh, throughout Europe and um, um, uh, made tracks in uh, mud, uh, um, uh, marks in the mud uh, uh, in the width of their wheels. And because they were uh, driving all the way through Europe, people would standardize their horse and carriage to that same width. Because if you don't fit in the tracks that were already there made by the Romans, um, you would break off your wheel or you would skid over or something that you, uh, that you didn't want. So actually, because the Romans were conquering Europe, uh, the train tracks were, uh, were, uh, uh, are now uh, that width. And then I thought, but why, why, why did the, the Romans have their horse and carriage uh, uh, in that same width? And what I found out is that because those uh, fighter men that you see here in a, in a fighter carriage um, uh, were having two horses, um, they needed to go around with their swords and whatever fighting equipment around the horses um, and that exact width would make sense to just bear, just be 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 uh, protected by the by the horses, and we're just able to uh, to move around the horses' ass. So, our fourteen hundred and thirty-five millimeter train track is actually based on horses' asses. So, why am I talking about horses' asses all of a sudden? I will get uh, I will get back to you um, about the horse in, uh, about that horse in a couple of seconds. First of all, uh, let's not talk about the horses' asses. Let's talk about myself for one second. And uh, my name is Jules Molinar. I've been doing something with Agile for the past fifteen years. Um, and I uh, once got trained by Jeff Sutherland, one of the first trainings in uh, in Europe, uh, one not one, the first uh, Scrum training in Europe. And from there, I got um, um, infected with the agile uh, mindset and uh, idea, and I wanted to change the world um, for a better place uh, uh, when it comes to work, that is. Um, <clears throat> and I did all kinds of agile coaching jobs, big changes, small changes. And every time I, um, I, was, uh, I was guiding those changes, I was, I was coaching the teams, helping them uh, deliver better products, uh, I ran into management. Um, and um, all the companies I saw had traditional management. So I was uh, thinking, why the hell do we, uh, do we have that? What, what is happening? And why does anybody, everybody wants, wants to be a manager at some point in, uh, in his career? Um, so I looked up where is this uh, where is this coming from, and I um, I found out that uh, this man was uh, was at the uh, at the basis of what we uh, what we in uh, in a lot of uh, uh, command and control uh, traditional management uh, uh, companies still call uh, management. Um, does anybody recognize this man by any chance? I see all kinds of shaking hats. Well, that uh, gives me the space to uh, tell you who it is. It's Mr. Frederick Taylor. And now, who is Mr. Frederick Taylor? Mr. Frederick Taylor invented Taylorism. What is Taylorism? Taylorism is, an, is, 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 is the, another word or another name for scientific management. Maybe you've heard about scientific management. And what scientific management entails 
is a working force and a management force. And what did uh, Mr. Frederick Taylor find found out is that people are stupid. Well, that was his opinion. Uh, he might might have sli slightly said it a little bit different, but he was quite amazed with the stupidity of people. Meaning, why do they always deviate from the best way of doing the work? Um, and that's why he invented Taylorism or scientific management. And he started to measure what's the best way to perform a repetitive task. Mark my word, repetitive task. And he found out that if you find the best way to um, do a repetitive task, that people shouldn't be allowed to deviate from the approach. So they shouldn't uh, think for themselves how to do the work. And unfortunately, people uh, do think for themselves and love to think for themselves. Uh, so that's why he found out that a lot of deviation in, in quality or speed of, uh, of performing repetitive work was, uh, was being um, uh, uh, yeah, noticed. So what he said is to prevent that, you need to have a management force and the management force need to tell the working force exactly how to do the work. The working force needs to shut up and just do the work. Um, and the man management uh, force does the, do, yeah, does the thinking for them. Um, and I already um, uh, mentioned um, uh, repetitive work. And for repetitive work, it might work. Um, well, not might work. It is uh, beneficial. It is effective to, uh, to have a way to um, uh, 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 manage, manage people and um, <clears throat> um, have a working force just to, uh, to perform the, the task. Uh, the same and uh, after the same, after the same, after the same. Uh, but nowadays, we are not in a repetitive work environment anymore. We are in a fast changing environment. Some people might have heard somewhere in the, in the conference the word VUCA, uh, V-U-C-A, a volatile world with a lot of uncertainty, a lot of complexity, and a lot of ambiguity. And in that VUCA world, uh, we need... Um, we need agility we need another style of leadership so i knew that and i was teaching all kinds of companies uh, to do that and how to do that um but i also found out that it's uh, that it's quite hard to do it yourself so what's my uh, my journey i started out with Egon, small teams um um, I was teaching them to uh, to do Scrum, didn't uh, interfere with management uh, so much, um, and that's where I uh, that's where I uh, got my uh, uh, certified Scrum Master training 15 years ago, like I uh, like I told you. Uh, I did a very big change within ING um, uh, later, uh, where we worked with squads and tribes and a whole flat organization with lots of self-organization and almost no management anymore. Um, and later on, we also applied those principles to, uh, to KLM, uh, who really needs a lot of uh, adaptability at the moment, uh, because we all know what, uh, what's going on in the world of airplanes. Um, so a couple of, just a couple of uh, companies that I was guiding, not such small companies, and I was uh, actually coaching them and guiding them into new leadership styles uh, uh, quite successfully, to uh, to be honest. And then four years ago, I started uh, Epic Agility, and I thought, you know, if I can teach people, uh, and I've been doing that for uh, for 11, 12 years right now, if I can teach and mentor and coach people to uh, to be agile and uh, and perform new leadership styles, I'll probably do that. Uh, I'll probably uh, uh, are very able to do that myself also. So. Uh, that uh, that uh, that was uh, that was not so successful as I uh, I thought or hoped um, at the start. Um, telling anybody uh, is apparently easier than uh, performing it yourself. I knew all the uh, theory, so I switched quite fast between the slides. I knew all the theory. I knew that I knew, shouldn't be a heroic manager anymore. I knew that I sh shouldn't be uh, solving uh, all the problems and everybody's problems uh, all the time. I knew that I uh, shouldn't be trying to keep everybody satisfied and um, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, work twice as hard as, as everybody um, uh, or be involved in anybody uh, with everybody's work. But it is so hard when it is your own company, I found out uh, uh, later. Uh, so I knew the theory and I was teaching all the, why does this keep moving? Yeah, I was teaching all these principles to people. How do you uh, become an uh, agile organization at scale? What leadership do you uh, uh, want to have? So these working principles were, uh, were, were um, written all around me. 
uh, but again, uh, writing them down and knowing the theory doesn't mean that you can already uh, perform, uh, perform the task. So what were the working principles that I knew? You should start with encouraging agile leadership in a, in a new agile organization. Then if you become a purpose-driven organization, if you know why people get out of bed in the morning, like I said, with Epic Agility, we try to make the working world a little bit better every day. People love to get out of bed every morning and try to improve this working world a little bit. Um, and why people want to come to work matters. And then you can start talking about KPIs and uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, goals, visions, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, but first of all, create a people-centric organization. Be, be people-centric and create trust at scale, which is pretty damn hard to do. So, and I will give you another example about trust a little bit uh, a little bit later. Um, shared goals, have shared goals throughout your organization, and then shared metrics. Uh, and never measure somebody individually like uh, Frederick Taylor would do so. Because if you measure and uh, give people individual goals, you get individual behavior. So that's very important for your leadership style to create those uh, shared goals. And then install agility, install adaptability. Always know one thing for sure. And that is that you never know something for sure, uh, uh, except from everything is going to change. Uh, so the only certainty is that everything will change. Install adaptability and that's your risk control. And then you can start to talk about um, organizational uh, processes, uh, structures, uh, stakeholders, feedback loops and stuff like that. But start with this softer side, this slightly um, less tangible side of why we come to work and what this, uh, this agile leadership uh, was. So I was teaching all these people this and um, Again, being quite successful there. So I thought I could do it myself uh, also. And then after two years in uh, Epic Agility, I was, uh, I was struggling. Um, so two years ago, I read the book, The Hard Thing About Hard Things. It's from Ben Horowitz. Very nice book, by the way, if, you, uh, um, if you're interested. Especially when you're an entrepreneur, you will recognize everything in this book, uh, no matter what kind of company you have. Um, and one of the things that I found myself being in is the struggle. Now, what is the struggle? Uh, the struggle um, gave me a feeling of why did I start this company in the first, in the first place? Um, why uh, uh, don't I quit? Why uh, uh, do people still trust me uh, uh, being their leader? Um, um, how, uh, 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 how the hell am I going to guide this company out of this uh, situation? Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's when I take a week off and that I get more stressed than, um, than, uh, than, than, I, than I started out uh, with that week. So the struggle is not a nice place to be. And I found out in this book that I was directly into the struggle. And I also found out that in, the, in this book that most people are not strong enough. So that gave me a lot of hope. Um, that was a nice thing to learn. But I also learned if you get out of your struggle, greatness comes, uh, comes towards you. And I found out that every leader in a company, when you are in this new position, will go through the struggle at some point. You do need to learn to get out of the struggle. And again, not everybody is strong enough, but if you get out of it, indeed, greatness uh, comes from it. And you are able to hand over the work to your people and you are able to engage the people uh, to do the best that they get, can and then you're off to the races. So what did I learn? Never ever keep your problems for yourself. You don't have to solve everything yourself. So share your problems. The minute after I started to learn to share my problems, uh, I engaged, I activated 10 smart professional quick thinking people to help solve all the problems in the company uh, instead of having one um, uh, halfly occupied uh, brain thinking about solving the problem. You have to play long enough uh, uh, and then at some point you might get lucky. Uh, and no, you won't get lucky. You just have to play long enough and keep going. At some point you will, uh, you will absolutely know how to solve the problem, uh, but you have to figure that out and don't take everything or anything actually personally. Um, and once you go through these steps, 
you're off to the races and are able to uh, to perform a new style of leadership. But probably you don't know what is on this picture, but what it says, you're only going to see it once you know it, or you're only going to know it once you see it. And it's a very um, interesting uh, uh, saying uh, performed by uh, by a Dutch, uh, the most uh, familiar, uh, I mean, most famous Dutch football player, Johan Cruyff. And he had this way of saying it, and it's so true. You won't know how to be a CEO until you see it. Um, so that's what I uh, that's what I learned. That doesn't mean that you have to be been through everything to be a successful uh, CEO. Um, and like I was saying, in, uh, as an agile coach to everybody, if you want your people to perform a different leadership style, be the change you want to see in the world. Uh, show the behavior that you that you want to see yourself. Um, and um, I was apparently at first showing traditional leadership behavior, getting traditional uh, employee uh, behavior. Um, so then I found out that uh, the new leadership style is twice as hard as, uh, as an old power leadership. It's way easier just to tell people how to do their work than to uh, activate and uh, and encourage them to uh, to think for themselves. Um, but if you are able uh, to uh, to go through it and uh, perform a new style of leadership, again, you're off to the races and you have actively engaged um, professional thinking uh, people. So I wanted to shift from being a problem solver, always trying to solve everybody's problems um, and having the feeling that I was responsible for solving all of their problems to being a solution seeker. And I found this such a powerful say, move from being a problem solver to being a solution seeker. What's a solution seeker? That's somebody that asks questions, uh, that have people think for themselves by asking the right questions questions, being supportive, being a servant leader. Um, I found out that the amount of trust in my organization is in um, reverse balance with the need for communication. What does this mean? If you sense around you that a lot of communication is needed still, then you can uh, gently conclude that there is little or too less little um, uh, 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 trust in your organization. If you have a very high amount of mutual trust in your communication, the, um, the, 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 the communication bandwidth um, um, becomes way smaller, meaning that you need less words to uh, uh, communicate and hand over work, for example. Um, and you got to get the horses' asses. So I promise to, uh, to get back about these horses' asses. Why was I talking about horses' asses before? Um, um, the horses' ass is a metaphor for in your organization, we have always done it like this. Why are we filling in this form? Yeah, we always done it like this. Why is a train track 1435 millimeters? It is what it is. No, it's not what it is. Find what's behind it. And you will find out that maybe generation or career step after career step, the organization formed around, yeah, that's how we do it nowadays. But is it still the best way? Is there another way to, 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 to solve this, uh, this, this challenge? Is there another way to co collaborate with each other? Is there another way to compose our teams? Is there another way to perform management? Is there another way to approach the, 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 the CEO? Find out, challenge the status quo and catch those horses' asses. And the funny thing is that I found out in organizations where I, where I performed the, the, the presentation to talk about horses' asses, um, that people start to perform a language. Hey, here's where we have a horse ass again. Is it is it because we always did it like this, or is this really the best way to uh, to perform this uh, this uh, this task? And you want to have that behavior in your organization. So gotta catch all those uh, those horses asses. I uh, I have another question uh, for you guys. What's this? Who wants to take a wild guess? What are we looking at? NASA's service station. It is. Uh, it is a, a NASA uh, space shuttle. Um, 
And uh, I don't know what space shuttle it is, to be honest, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, who knows what that, that, that big orange thing and the two, uh, two white things next to it is? Fuel tanks. Those are indeed fuel tanks and or uh, oxygen, which is uh, uh, actually also... Uh, I fuel. said on mute. I was the first one to say it was not... Uh, missed, missed your chance, missed your chance. But they are fuel tanks, um, and they they uh, they fall off at some point. Doesn't really matter either. Um, they have a very peculiar shape. I found out they are um, actually very oddly shaped. Uh, a better shape would be, uh, I heard, uh, to be slightly bigger at some point and and formed slightly uh, slightly different. Um, but apparently. They are a little bit under 1,435 millimeters uh, wide. You know why? Because from Cape Canaveral, where they launched those uh, those uh, those space shuttles, to um, uh, to the factory where I, where they built those uh, those fuel tanks, they need to move on a train through a tunnel. Um, where um, uh, uh, from where they are made to uh, to where they are launched. So actually, that Mars rover thing that we just saw uh, landed on uh, on um, on Mars um, is being launched with space shuttle uh, supportive fuel tanks that are based on. This is the time where you say a horse is on. Horses asses. So, another thing to uh, to install in your uh, install in your uh, company, and then uh, I'm going to wrap it up and see if there are any uh, any questions left. I found out uh, a half a year ago that culture in your company matters, and culture is something very interesting. Culture is something uh, where uh, what you can't really grasp, you can't grab it, you can't really. Um, uh, you, you, everybody feels it. Everybody's aware of it. Everybody performs according to the culture, but nobody generally fully clearly can describe what is culture and or what is my, uh, my company culture. But at some point, you need to do something about it in your company. When your team size, when your department size, or in my case, your company size grows, you need to do something with culture to uh, to make it more tangible. So we did uh, we did a lot of workshops uh, within Epic Agility, and we were grasping what is it that 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 binds us. What 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 is it that uh, that is in our DNA? What is it that is in our in our carpets, in our in our drinks in the refrigerator? Uh, what's that pattern that we can recognize uh, that's actually guiding uh, us as a team? And how can we make that explicit so that we can keep on growing? Because when you're at 10 people, it's fine. People will 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 um, uh, move like a zip, and they will uh, they will uh, uh, chip in. But when you're fastly growing and you're growing over that uh, that amount of people, you need to have some tangible uh, reference to to what is the company culture. And we found out within Epic Agility that uh, we have three words that are clarifying our uh, company culture. And if you find and make that culture more tangible, you actually make decisions. Me as a CEO of that company made maybe a million decisions for the future because people will start to talk about what is epic and is it what we are doing? Is that now epic? Epic agility being epic. Um, and is that now epic? And why is it epic? Is this is this proposal epic? Is this coffee epic? Is this training that we're performing epic? Is this a talk that I'm doing in agility today? Is that epic enough? And how do we measure what is epic to have three words or three slight uh, small sentences uh, to justify whether it's epic or not? And we, we, we spend a lot of time and performed a lot of effort in it, put a lot of effort in it to set up this, this, this three guiding principles to, to, to justify and clarify our culture. And you see that people talk about it and that it, it ups their, their game, their collaboration, uh, their trust in each other uh, by talking about these three words. And these are for my company. These are our words. This is what 
what we do, this is what we are, uh, and what we are is fun. So first of all, they are translated from Dutch, so it, it, I will explain a little bit um, because they work better in Dutch. Fun, fun is our most important uh, driver. Is this uh, invoice that we're sending, is that showing a little bit of fun or is it very boring invoice, flat number, something? Um, and we want to have it a little bit fun. Is it slightly different what we are doing? Or are we just doing the same thing as, uh, as our competitors? And do we excel or do we exceed expectations? Is it just a little bit better? Are we upping our game? And we ask ourselves that, like I said, with everything, whether it's buying um, new drinks for in, the, in the training, is it the coffee, the proposal, the training itself, um, the desks, the computer, is it showing fun, being slightly different, and Excel? And if you if you clarify this culture in your company, then you're off to the races, and everybody is going to perform and act as a leader in your in your organization. And that's actually what you want: create leaders and not followers in your organization. Um, and then to uh, wrap it all up, um, also know that leadership is not always fun uh, like i said um, don't try to set us uh, keep everybody satisfied but no like steve Jobs said if you want to make everybody happy go sell ice cream if you want to be a leader something else is going to happen that was my talk about new styles of leadership be uh, be uh, welcome to invite me on linkedin um i will uh, i will answer all the questions uh, that you have i hope that you like my talk um, any questions left? Or remarks also fine. It was fun. It was, I loved listening to you. I've just been having such a great time. Thank you very much. Can I help somebody with, uh, with, uh, with some questions? Uh, I've also find out that we have some minutes on the clock left. So please be welcome. I will, uh, I will answer all the questions. It's also funny and uh, interesting for me to see that uh, online everything goes a little bit faster, uh, uh, I guess. But let me just stop sharing my screen, by the way. Uh, if you find me, I want to find me on, uh, on LinkedIn. Um, uh, I will uh, probably be in the, in the schedule. Um, I will try to stop talking. Uh, any questions? Again, somebody. Uh, not really a question, but I just want to give you a feedback. It was an amazing talk. One of the best I've actually heard, uh, especially the examples you used, they were very creative. I mean, you know, all going back to the horse's ass. So loved it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. And please always, uh, I say that always, be free to, uh, to steal all my stories. They're not, uh, they're not uh, trademarked or anything. So uh, if it helps, tell the story of the horses asses in your company to, uh, to uh, uh, start uh, solving them, uh, I would say. Well, thank you. I will definitely take that. So. Very welcome. Um, and uh, and uh, maybe the, the the guides can also help me. Uh, I will uh, I will also share my uh, my slides later. So uh, feel free to uh, to uh, to copy anything from me. But uh, it would be nice if you uh, if you mention me uh, and where you uh, where you found the information from. You will be given all the credit. Thank you very much. Anything else that I can help you with? Okay, since nobody's asking, I actually have a question for you, uh, right. if you don't mind. So most of these organizations, in my experience, I've seen, you know, they, they claim to be agile, all mm -hmm. right? Uh, all the big ones, even the Fortune 50s, 100s, 500s, I've worked with most of them. They all claim to be agile, but in the back end, it's a dysfunction that they still do traditional management hierarchy. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh... And how do you overcome that? I, I also see that uh, that a lot of the companies that I uh, that I am uh, guiding or that are my customers or also not even my customers, they are saying that they want to be agile. Uh, 
and sometimes I doubt their reasons. Um, do they want it because it's a hype and it's popular and, and it's, it, it's actually some sort of a demand? Or do they truly believe that it's going to improve their, their company? And I, I doubt that, that the latter uh, sometimes, to, uh, to be honest. And then I see indeed that a lot of traditional management is still being, uh, being kept uh, alive, I guess, in, uh, in a company. And then you, you have this hybrid situation of, of at the one hand, we, we try to, to, to be more agile, be more self-organizing, uh, but we still have a management layer that is very command and control uh, driven. Um, and what I found out is that in, 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 in nine out of 10 times, people want to change. People, everybody, also the management layers, everybody wants to change. That's no problem. It's just that they don't want to be changed. And I've seen so many agile coaches uh, also in my career pushing Scrum, pushing a method, pushing a new a new way of working. This is uh, this is uh, the holy grail, the silver bullet. This is how it should solve all our our problems. Um, and especially management, they do want to try to change. They just haven't seen this new way of working work yet so sell it to them what's in it for them define their new role guide them into their new role and don't start pushing them out of the way this is not what you're not allowed to do anymore help them what they are are allowed to do uh, or what's expected from them, how they can help that organization. And I think that's the that's the, the, the best advice that I can give there. What's in it for them, ha guide them into their new role, stop saying what they can't do anymore and start coaching them into what's expected from them and how they can help uh, being successful in the new organization. And then, then everybody will, will, will try to change uh, slightly, but give it some time. It's not gonna change overnight. Does that answer your question a little bit? Yes, it does. And in fact, I do practice some of that. I mean, I've been coaching for a while. So, so yeah, I just brought it for, to the broader audience, actually, and to get your thoughts as well. So, Cool. Um, I, um, I still have some time on the clock, I guess. Uh, what shall we do, uh, ladies? Shall I just wait around and see if there are any other questions or shall we wrap it up and uh, give people some, uh, some uh, switching time? What's, uh, what's, what's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, so there are two things that we would like to do. First of all, I'll be uh, putting up a poll so that we can get the feedback. Um, and also, since we have time, I would suggest uh, let everyone just uh, switch on their cameras and we'll take a nice picture of all of us. Yeah. So uh, everyone, can, can we just uh, switch, off, switch on our cameras? And we'll take a nice photograph. Yeah, I can see a lot of cameras there. Great. I'm clicking. Smile, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I'm just putting up a poll as well. Uh, till then, anybody else has anything else they would like to discuss with Jerome or anybody else, please feel free. Perfect. And if you want to dive into what is agile leadership a little bit more, let me do some uh, shameless uh, self-promotion then. Uh, we have a training, I think, in uh, one or two weeks. I, I also saw Manzi, uh, my, uh, my business partner in, uh, in our Indian uh, branch, uh, being here. We have a certified agile leadership training, a three-day training about essentials, teams, and uh, organizations, which I will, in which I will dive into uh, this uh, new styles of leadership, how to guide organizations uh, way further. So if you're interested in that or, or, or have any in-depth questions that I uh, should answer, please be welcome in that training and please reach out to, uh, to uh, me or Monty if, uh, if you want to learn more about it. Um, and in any other case, I still have uh, six minutes on my clock to, uh, to answer your questions uh, right now. So I'll just stick around um, if there are any questions. And uh, how, how do we see the poll, uh, Nikita? Yeah, I'm just trying, but for some reason, my poll has gone inactive. I'm just uh, figuring it out. Give me a minute. So it will be with one of one of the two of you. So probably with Anjuman or with you. And yeah. So Dipti, I'm also getting the same as message uh, that I've been not allowed to do so. I do have polling. Okay. 
Should I launch? Uh, should I launch the poll? That would be great. Yeah. Okay, so probably then you all have given the host <laughs> rights to year on. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I think I've I've launched the poll. All right. Yes. You haven't gone it. I think we are done with the poll as well.